Here we go on a journey of yellow fever in the United States, which might be something you know nothing about. I'm going to paint a little picture for you, okay? You can close your eyes if you want. It's not weird. We're all friends, okay? It's 1793 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's extremely, extremely hot. In fact, at the time, this was going to be the most hot summer on record, the hottest summer ever recorded to that, to that date in particular. It's really humid. You could, like, cut it with a knife. Uh, and this is exacerbated by the fact that there's swamps all over the city, and what I mean by swamps is there's holes dug into the ground where people have been discarding human and animal waste, and then they're collecting rainwater, and you've got this beautiful breeding ground for mosquitoes everywhere. And so this was really going to drive one of the worst yellow fever outbreaks the U.S. has ever seen. And by the end of the summer, really the fall in 1793, more than 10% of Philadelphia's population had died. And a greater proportion of that population had run away somewhere else, including major politicians at the time, which is one, not the primary, but one of the reasons why the capital city was moved elsewhere. There were a lot of concerns about health and safety in Philadelphia at the time, and this played a major role. Yellow fever is caused by a virus in the family Flaviviridae, and it's transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which you see here. Uh, most people that get yellow fever virus actually don't have any symptoms or they get symptoms that are generally considered mild. So things like fever, headache, maybe some nausea and vomiting. Rarely, a smaller proportion of people will get severe disease, which can have uh, really terrible things like internal hemorrhaging and severe hepatitis, which results in this jaundice, which is where the yellow comes from in yellow fever. And in these cases, about 50% of the people with severe disease will die. So, you know, this is why this was so severe at a time when very few people had, if anybody at all, had immunity to this uh, when it arrived. Uh, it's believed that yellow fever originated or came about in Africa, but was brought to the Western Hemisphere in the 1600s, unfortunately, via slave trade. Um, they think that mosquitoes from endemic areas hitched a ride on these ships on water barrels and then subsequently were released into a very uh, naive, immunologically naive population uh, when those ships arrived, which was really, really devastating. Here's a really nice image of what yellow fever in a severe case might look like. This is a wood carving from around the time, and this man is obviously, I think, vomiting blood. Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty intense, but this is just a, you know, a, a, a nice infographic of, of how severe this disease could get at the time. Uh, this is another illustration that was done around the same time the 1793 outbreak was uh, really bad, and this shows a family that's just been devastated by yellow fever in Memphis, which was another area that was hit really hard. So it was really the port cities in the U.S. that were receiving these trade ships and often had slaves on them um, were getting these really bad outbreaks. So we're going to fast forward several years from 1793 um, there is a young man at the time named Dr., eventually Dr. Carlos Finlay, who was studying medicine in Philadelphia and studying yellow fever virus. And after he finished his education, he went back to Cuba, which is where he was originally from, and continued to devote his life to figuring out how yellow fever virus was spread and what it was. They didn't know it was a virus at the time. And so he's doing all this work, and he gets some evidence that makes him believe that this agent is transmitted via mosquitoes. And he presents this at a medical conference in Cuba in, I think, 1886. And everyone laughs him out of the room. He's severely ridiculed for this theory. Everybody thinks that this is contagious. It's spread human to human. Uh, and they severely doubt that this could possibly be spread by a mosquito. And so at the time, this was almost completely devastating for his career. Um, and he just kind of had to sit with it and, and you know, keep working on his theory. But people would not accept it. And it wasn't until about 20 years later that this would actually be confirmed. Interestingly, uh, in the U.S., outbreaks continued to happen, particularly in New Orleans, which was getting hit especially hard. Um, thousands of people were dying, and the Spanish-American War had actually started, and there were U.S. Uh, military service people in Cuba and other areas where this was happening, and they, more people were dying from yellow fever than from the war effort. And so the uh, US military decided to create what was called the Yellow Fever Commission at the time, which was led by Dr. Walter Reed. And this name might sound familiar because this is a pretty famous hospital in DC. 
um, he took a whole team of people down to Cuba and started collaborating with Dr. Finlay on trying to figure out what was causing this. Um, and ultimately, between that group of people and Dr. Reed's team, they discovered that, in fact, this virus was transmitted via a mosquito. And they were the ones that also discovered that it was small enough to transfer through a bacterial filter. And so this, they're also the ones that confirmed that it was likely a virus. Although this wouldn't be um, fully identified or isolated for almost 25 more years. Um, interestingly, all of the work that that group did in Cuba led to a lot of public health interventions, like use of insecticides, getting rid of you know, standing water, or breeding grounds for mosquitoes, and cases started to drop really significantly. And this is actually what saved the building of the Panama Canal. So I think it was around 1905, by 1905, about 85% of people that had been working on the Panama Canal had been hospitalized for either malaria or yellow fever, and like nobody was going back to that job site, right? <laughs> like, it's a death trap, we're not doing it. And so the, the construction site was just sitting there forever. Uh, so in 1906, an, another team assembled, went to the Panama Canal site, did a bunch of efforts around Panama um, that were primarily interventional in terms of preventing mosquitoes from breeding. Um, and they actually eliminated the outbreak in the area. And the last known outbreak, major outbreak of yellow fever in the United States was in 1905 in New Orleans. And this was transferred over to the U.S. Use of insecticides and some of these other public health measures um, were really what ended this outbreak overall. Here's a picture of Dr. Walter Reed. I think it's important to note that he's often the one that's credited for really figuring out what was causing yellow fever, but uh, really it was his entire team and that foundational work from Dr. Carlos Finlay that was instrumental to this discovery. Um, and several of his team members actually ended up getting the virus and dying uh, when they were working on this in Cuba. Um, so a lot of sacrifices were made in the discovery of this. So we're going to fast forward many more years, and we're now in 1930. This is Dr. Max Thyler, who was working at the Rockefeller Institute uh, doing research on yellow fever. And up until he made some very uh, paramount discoveries, all the research was being done in monkeys, which was very costly and labor intensive. And he started injecting the virus into the brains of mice. And they started playing around with this a little bit and taking infected mouse brain, mashing it up, putting it in serum that had antibodies to yellow fever, and then putting it back in mice. And they were realizing they were seeing this protective effect. And so his team was really the one that uh, led or were able to like quantify protective antibodies or start looking at that and transfer that over to humans. And this is really the basis of some of the diagnostic tests that were developed and certainly the vaccine, which has been instrumental um, ever since. So like I said, the last major outbreak of yellow fever occurred in 1905 in New Orleans, and certainly the use of the vaccine has saved countless lives across the world, but the disease burden is really still very significant in tropical and subtropical areas of Latin America and Africa. Um, the cycle that you see on my left-hand side of the slide here is called the sylvatic cycle. So this is where the mosquitoes will transfer the virus uh, to non-human primates, and then that cycle continues. And that one can actually be particularly troublesome um, because when there's spillover from that cycle into a naive population, you can get really massive outbreaks. Um, that urban cycle where we see the spread between mosquitoes and humans, that's a little easier to interrupt through vaccination and then some of the other methods I already mentioned, but the sylvatic's a little bit harder to break up. So there's a lot of work going on in this, in this kind of space here, thinking about uh, do we immunize non-human primates or how do we break that cycle? Because um, that one could actually be a really um, significant cause of, of major outbreaks. Yellow fever can be really hard to diagnose because it mimics many other severe diseases like malaria or hemorrhagic fevers. Um, the incidence isn't, isn't fully realized, I think, because diagnostics and ground surveillance uh, might be a little lacking in some of the endemic areas, but it's estimated that there's anywhere between 200,000 to 300,000 cases a year still in these, in these areas. So it's still a significant cause of uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, antibody testing is, is one of the most common tests you can do for this, and there's also RT-PCR. Um, RT-PCR tends to be positive early in the disease, but that can fall off very quickly, and you could get a false negative result. So a negative result from RT-PCR really doesn't necessarily mean you do not have disease. Um, and then alternatively, there's things that can really give um, confusing results with antibody testing. So um, things like the vaccination um, of status of people may play a role there, maybe might confuse things up a bit. And then cross-reactivity with other flaviviruses can also uh, make that challenging. 
So like I said, the prevention of yellow fever primarily relies on vaccination and then um, prevention of breeding and spread of mosquitoes. Um, the vaccine is really interesting. I, I wrote a separate article on this uh, and interviewed some really phenomenal researchers uh, from Africa that are working on fractional dosing of yellow fever vaccine. One of our biggest challenges is that there is always a shortage of supply of yellow fever vaccine globally. And when there's great need, there's often not enough. And so researchers have been doing incredible work in looking at um, how effective smaller doses of yellow fever vaccine are. Uh, the vaccine itself is really wonderful. It's a live attenuated vaccine and it offers lifelong protection within 30 days of administration in 99% of patients so or people that get it. Um, so it's very effective and wonderful, but we need more of it. This vaccine is also still grown in eggs or you know, manufactured in eggs. So it's like a very long, arduous process to make this. And so um, that also can contribute certainly to the shortages that we see. And then future areas of research or ongoing research are really focusing on climate change, distribution of mosquitoes and movement of mosquitoes, um, particularly in some recent outbreaks that have happened where there's been spillover from that sylvatic cycle into large, uh, densely populated areas with a population of people that are uh, maybe don't have as much immunity as some of these other endemic areas we see, which is a big cause for concern. Um, we know that changing climate conditions and the movement of some of these vectors certainly plays a role as well. Um, and the reason I always give microbe history talks like this is because I think in the U.S. we tend to think we don't have this and we won't ever have this again, and that's not true. Um, certainly lots of other areas of the world, countries outside the U.S. have a, a large burden of this and have to deal with this, but we should always be thinking about our microbe history, what we did well, what we didn't do well, what we can learn, and what we might need to think of uh, when these things inevitably come back around, which is why I like to always share a little history. And then the final thing I'll note is this book, if you have not read it, is absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend it if you want to read more um, about exactly what I'm talking about here today. This takes a really nice deep dive into the history of yellow fever, particularly in the U.S. Um, it's a great read. It's, uh, it's just lovely. So thanks.